Last time we talked about different shot types, or more specifically shot sizes. If you haven't watched that video, I suggest you do so first because we're going to refer to some information that we covered there. In this video we will be talking about different types of shots that are less focused on the frame size. I wish more women were like this. If you know and understand all the shot types we covered last time and the ones we're going to cover today, you will be able to tell much better visual stories. There is a reason why they say show them, don't tell them. I decided to split this topic in multiple parts because there is one key difference between the shots we learned last time and the ones we're going to learn today. Every single frame that was ever created or will be created falls into one of the shot types we covered in part 1. Well, at least as long as we shoot film on cameras and view it on screens. Before we start, I want to clarify something. Whenever I say a certain shot type is used for a certain thing, this is a useful shot to make our subject feel small and insignificant, or to show the scale of a location, for example. I don't mean this is the only thing you can use the shot for, it all depends on the context of your video. I can't stress this enough, any shot can change its meaning if you put another shot before or after it. The context is really key here. So you might have heard of Lev Kuleshov. He was a famous director in Soviet Union back in the day. He once did a test that some of you might have seen before. So he once used a close-up of a man who had a serious look on his face and he showed that close-up to three different audiences. Audience number one saw a shot of a bowl of soup before they saw the close-up of the man. Audience number two saw a shot of a child lying in a coffin before they saw the close-up of the man. And audience number three saw a shot of a beautiful woman before they saw the close-up of the man. All three audiences praised the man for his acting ability. They said he portrayed grief and love and hunger very beautifully, even though he didn't change his facial expression at all. This was a groundbreaking discovery and is used in every type of content to this day. The context really is key. With that being said, let's get to it. The high angle shot is any shot above the eye level of the character. It can go from slightly above the eye level to all the way from the top of a building, for example. The high angle shot has many different uses. It can make our subject appear smaller or weaker, or to show the geography of a location, for example, or maybe just a point of view of a bird. There are countless other uses for this shot type, or any shot type for that matter. Like I said, it all depends on the context of the scene. Now let's take a look at a couple of examples of the high angle. Unsurprisingly, the low angle is pretty much the opposite of the high angle. Anything shot below the eye level is considered low angle. Like with the high angle, it can vary from slightly below the eye level to all the way when the camera is flat on the ground looking up. The low angle is used for, surprise surprise, the opposite of the high angle. If used in the same context, of course. So our subject can feel bigger and more powerful. So for both the high and low angle, a little above or a little below the eye line is already enough for the audience to feel the difference. Now let's take a look at a couple of examples. Now you would think this is an obvious one, but don't let the name over the shoulder fool you. Over the shoulder is not only a shot of one subject with another subject's shoulder in the frame, in fact, we don't even need to see any shoulder. Any shot where one subject is used as a foreground for another subject can qualify as an over-the-shoulder. We don't even need two people to shoot an over-the-shoulder, just like this. Or, even a more clever way, like this. An over-the-shoulder can be used for many different reasons. For one, you can create depth by adding a foreground element. Or, more important one, to show how two characters on the screen are connected to one another. This is a very important shot type, you can see it in almost any movie nowadays. This is why I'm going to create a separate video that focuses only on over the shoulder and how it connects to the other shot types, so stay tuned for that. For now, let's take a look at a couple of examples of the over the shoulder. A shot that complements the over-the-shoulder like no other is the single. 
A signal is a shot of one person with no other people visible in the frame. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no other people in the scene. It can even be a conversation between the two people. In a signal, you only see one person. That's the point. A signal can be used to communicate loneliness or disconnect between characters. Or it can be used for practical reasons. Maybe there is no one else in the scene. Now, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Two shot is a shot of two characters. Like with all the shots we covered today, the frame size doesn't really matter. So it can be a close up of two people or a medium shot or a wide shot, it doesn't matter. As long as there are two people in the frame, it is called a two shot. The only exception is the over the shoulder. Because over the shoulder, one subject acts as a foreground. So he's not really a subject in the frame. He's just a foreground element. If there are more than two people in the frame, let's say three, then it's called a three shot. If there is four people, it's called a four shot, etc. If there is a bigger group, you can call it a group shot. Most of the time, however, if there is more than two people, you will refer to it as a group shot. Unless you want a specific number of people in the frame out of a bigger group. This shot type is often used to establish a hierarchy in a scene. Let's say the two characters are framed equally. They are most likely equals. If one character is framed higher or occupies more of the screen, he is probably more dominant one. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. This is a shot where the horizon level is not straight, but tilted to one side. It can be a subtle tilt or an extreme one. This shot is also sometimes called a Dutch tilt. Fun fact, the word Dutch in Dutch angle is actually not referring to the people from the Netherlands. It is a shot created by German filmmakers. So Dutch is actually a mispronunciation of the word Deutsch. And Deutsch means German. So maybe the real name is the Deutsch angle. So the Dutch angle is often used to make the audience feel uneasy. It suggests that something is wrong. A very cool way to show a strong negative emotion is to go from a level shot to the Dutch angle in one camera movement. In some old comics and in Batman the Animated Series, for example, the villains were always framed using the Dutch angle. Let's take a look at a couple of other examples. Now, aren't we all too familiar with this one, right guys? The old Call of Duty days? Point of view is like the name tells us, you're looking through a character's eyes. But there is one important factor when it comes to this shot type. You actually need to tell the audience that they're looking through a character's eyes, because how would they know? Unlike any other shot type I covered up to this point, the point of view cannot just be a clean frame on its own. It needs another shot or a camera movement or something that tells us that we're looking through the character's eyes. There are a few exceptions, of course, like looking through the binoculars or maybe the scope of a rifle. In this case, the vignetting will tell us that this is indeed the point of view. Now let's take a look at a couple of other examples. This is a shot that shows us where the next scene will be taking place. It is often, but not always, the first shot of the scene. Let's say you have a dinner scene. The shot of the restaurant might be an establishing shot for that scene. If you have a scene on the plane, then a shot of a wing might suffice as an establishing shot for that scene. But it doesn't have to be a wide shot either, because let's say you have a scene at McDonald's, the close-up of the yellow letter M would be enough to be an establishing shot for that scene. Now let's take a look at a couple of other examples. There are multiple definitions of the master shot. One definition is that the master shot is a recording of the entire scene from start to finish with all the actors and actions they take in that scene, in that location, from beginning to end. 
Another definition of the master shot is that it's a shot that shows us where a character is within a scene, or if there are multiple characters, where they are in relation to each other. Now both definitions look similar, but there's one clear difference. One scene is recorded in its entirety, while the other scene only records the parts that are likely to be used in an edit. However, they, they both have the same goal though. That goal is to show where everyone is located within a scene. This is an important shot type to understand, because every time we film a new location, if we don't use it, the audience will feel confused. I will be making a detailed video about the master shot and how to shoot coverage somewhere down the line. For now, let's take a look at a couple of examples of the master shot. So let's say there is a scene with a character sitting behind his desk. On his desk, we have a telephone. Now the telephone starts ringing. We see a close-up of the telephone. That close-up, it's called a cut-in. Next, the character is talking on the phone. Now all of a sudden, we see a close-up of a cuckoo clock on the wall. That cuckoo clock wasn't visible in the original frame. So this is a cutaway. So basically, a cut-in is a tighter shot of something that was already visible in the frame, except our character, of course. And a cutaway is a shot of something that wasn't visible in the frame. These were all the shot types. I hope you learned something new and now have a bigger arsenal to tell your stories visually in a better way. Next time, we will be taking a look at how professionals use some of the tools we learned in part 1 and 2. So stay tuned for part 3. I hope to see you all next time.